and we're recording now. And I'm gonna start with our first question. So the first question is, during your online workshops, what worked? And any of our panelists are more than welcome to start. I mean, I guess I'll go then. <laughs> um, uh, I'm Scott Peterson. I'm in the Arts and Humanities Division of the Library at UC Berkeley. And I've been involved with the Carpentries now for a few years. Um, very organically, I got questions about digital humanities, didn't know anything about coding. Took a software carpentry class, a data carpentry class, started helping, put on a library carpentry class, became an instructor, and now I've taught in all three of the carpentries. Um, so that's my spiel about myself. Um, so what worked? I mean, the workshops worked. Um, the feedback was great. Um, you know, some things didn't work as well as others. But I think overall, um, the, the two workshops I've been a part of have been good experiences. People were, you know, very glad to be able to take them. And the fact that um, people who wouldn't ordinarily be able to join the workshops because of um, where they lived were actually able to um, become a part of the workshops. And one of the things that actually happened recently is that um, I was hosting a discussion session last week. Somebody had just heard about the Carpentries like a week before it was a librarian, I think in Ottawa. And he, he um, just jumped into the discussion session. He wanted to know more about the Carpentries, wasn't affiliated. And then I was doing a pre-workshop debrief about the workshop I'm teaching next week at um, the American University in DC. And he was like, oh, great. So I can take this workshop too. And I was like, oh yeah, you can sign up. We just you know, put up the um, website and the Eventbrite. And so now he was able to like join from Ottawa. He had just literally heard about the Carpentries a couple weeks ago. Um, through, I think, a uh, librarian's message board, went to a discussion, and then he was able to get into a workshop right away. And I mean, I think that was because it was online. If it wasn't, I don't think he would have drove down from Ottawa to DC to you know, attend it. May I? Hey, uh, well, uh, I'm Laura Sion. I'm an academic health data scientist um, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, with the University of Buenos Aires. Um, I'm a trainer and instructor for the Carpentries. And before going into the what worked, I really would like to thank Angelique for reaching out and seeking that Latin America is represented in the session. And also thank everyone who's making Carpentry Con happening, like big yay, thank you everyone. I was super excited because I was, I mean, Carpentry Con in Madison was going to be my first international keynote before COVID. <laughs> so I was super excited about that. And then COVID hit us and um, I haven't been able to follow the thing, anything online because I am at home with two kids, six and eight years old. So <laughs> homeschooling, full time job. And so I'm, but I'm super glad I, I couldn't commit to a keynote online. Of course, that was a huge commitment, but you now participating here, it's a great way to contribute and I'm very thankful. So thank you everyone. And now to what worked. And with that introduction, you, I didn't teach any Carpentries workshops in, since March, but <laughs> because, well, um, in the region, we have no member institutions that fund the carpentry, really. So we, we, we were looking for member, uh, for member institutions. Uh, to, so the volunteer work here for the Carpentries is funded. And, and I had to stop, but so, but, but people needed, we, we went online, everything went online in mid-March here and in South America, Latin America. Uh, and people, I mean, our teachers don't know what a share document is or how to open, you know, do a Google Doc. <laughs> it's all magic. <laughs> so we had all these skills. We have trainers from the carpentries, instructors, uh, and, you know, people from our studio cert certified. We, we've been working with Greg Wilson as well. We, we knew so much that I, we needed to do something. So we started uh, uh, something that is called Metadocencia, which is meta teaching. And super inspired by the carpentries. We do follow God of Conduct. We, we welcome everyone's contributions. Um, we, what else? We teach together. Uh, we teach, we, we, we are teaching, we are learning 
uh, we are teaching to teach how to teach. I think I did I say that all right? Sorry. <laughs> and, and Janina is, well, Janina Bellini Saivena is here too. She's one of the co-founders of Metaocencia. Thank you, Shani, for, for joining us. And so we have uh, three trainers among founders, Nicolas Palopoli uh, and Paola Corrales and myself, a bunch of carpenters and structures. So we've been doing what we learned from you, from the carpentries. <laughs> and uh, what worked was mostly teaching in Spanish. You know, there's <laughs> uh, English is a huge barrier. Uh, also, uh, something that it's different from what I'm used to in the carpentries is teaching short self-contained and easily combined modules. Like workshops more than three hours, people don't even want to sign up. Even when they sign up for our three hours, they come thinking, this is going to be so long. And of course, we do active teaching as you as the carpentry store, <laughs> so they, they are surprised. They, they cannot believe how fast that things goes. Uh, but, uh, but more than three hours is a lot. We do take in workshop breaks about every 15 minutes, like five minute break, 10 minute break. And people love that. And it's, you know, it's necessary for the te teaching <laughs> standpoint too. And now that we are so, you know, the online thing is it's very intensive and, and divides our attention too much. And then also uh, we, we teach practical and basic skills um, and how to have an online classroom to the level where the Latin American region really needs it. Uh, so we have reached over, we have taught over 30 workshops already. Um, for about 500 people and 90% of them stay until the end in spite of connectivity problems. And we are having amazing post-workshop surveys. So that worked. I'm gonna jump in next because if I wait longer, I'll get more nervous. Um, and I'm Sarah Stevens and I'm a facilitator at UW-Madison and I help host our, organ our workshops here on campus. And uh, we've got, had a number of them in the last couple of months. And I, I love all things carpentry, so that's that's my introduction. Um, and um, so one of the some of the things that worked, I think, are those tried and true things that are really core to the carpentries, like hands-on live coding. Like people really like actually following along and being active uh, participants in there. Yeah, there's some co accommodations we have to make for it, and doesn't work because screen real estate is, I'd say, like the number one issue for teaching online. Um, and then. So, Another thing they really liked is that they had helpers to help them and yeah, they couldn't help them in exactly the same way and we had to think about that and how to make helpers fit in, but they still liked that there was someone there to help them and that we wanted to make sure that they were following along and learning the material. I think that like caring that our students actually are learning the materials is like one of the things that's tried and true still going to work um, in online format versus um, not online format and there was one thing I thought of that was not not something that we can do in person. I can't remember what it is anymore. So I'll say that that's what works so far. Oh, I guess my other thing is, is actually related to in person too, is that um, asking where people, what people, how that people are following along. Um, I think when you're new to instructing and online or in person, often you maybe only ask for problems. You're like, what, do you have any questions? And that you don't ask them, is everything going okay? Um, and so I think getting feedback from the learners that they are following along in person is easier because you can see them and you can have them put their, their sticky note up to indicate that they're in the right place. But finding ways to do that online, whether it's chat or the participants panel, um, I think is really vital for making sure that learners are, are keeping up with you and getting feedback as an instructor because they won't turn their camera on and you won't be seeing them, so. I'll say that's what worked. So I think I'll chime in to say, um, so I'm Diary Vanichkina. I'm a data scientist and uh, consultant, professional educator um, at all the way on the other side of the world at the University of Sydney. And I've been a part of the Carpentries for, I was looking at it since like 2014 or 2015. So it's been a really long time. It doesn't feel like it, but yeah. Um, and really now my role is, um, with, is more around being an instructor, instructor trainer, and really a community organizer, trying to build up support um, for instructors and sort of the instructor community here in Sydney and more widely across Australia. Um, and 
In terms of what I do for uh, as like my day job, I'm actually, uh, I uh, support a data science training program at the University of Sydney, um, where we run a wide range of sort of beginner and intermediate advanced workshops in data scientists for researchers across all the faculties, all the disciplines. So very much um, carpentry style workshops. Um, a lot of them are the two day format, sort of the live coding, the hands-on, all, all of the things. And I think in terms of what worked, I just want to say, so we, we had to pivot, we had some scheduled workshops um, that are sort of our core machine learning content, and we had to pivot them online pretty much in like with a couple of weeks notice. Um, so we, we had scheduled a workshop, we're like, you know what, it has to go online, everything's shutting down, and we're like, all right, we're going to go online, so just, we're just going to dive in. So the question, like there was a question for in one of our prompts about resources. At that stage, the only resource we had was like one video, YouTube video by Jason Bell, which I've linked to in the um, notes. And that was it. That was, and then the rest of it, we just sat down and spent like a couple of days figuring out, you know, how to do screen real estate, 30 different Zoom configurations, and we just, um, like, and when I say we, this was, I had a team of like, trainee instructors who were like, they, they were terrified, but also willing to give it a go. And I think that's the most, like something that I really want to highlight is giving it a go is, has been really important and giving it a go, trying to something that's like that alludes to what Sarah was mentioning is, you know what? Yes, online is going to be different. It's hard, it's challenging, but we're, we are going to go in there with you learners and we're going to sit there in the trenches and we're going to try to work with you to make sure you get as much out of this as you can. We don't know how much it's going to be. We don't know how, how this is going to work, but we're gonna go in there in the trenches and we're gonna be invested in having you learn as much as you can. And we're gonna just go, go with it. And I think that with the transition to online, that the fact that we've had to commit to that has become a lot more apparent and the learners really, re like that really resonates with the learners. It's really like, they, they, they value the fact that you're, you're spending however many days in Zoom with them trying to sort out a lot of these challenging, either technical or connectivity or other problems because, um, like Scott mentioned, we've had, so um, again, some of our students in Australia stayed, a lot of our students went back overseas. So for our workshop, for example, I, we had, for one of our workshops, we had a couple of students in China and there were issues with, you know, some things being blocked. Um, we couldn't link to a few resources. We had to like adjust and also connectivity wasn't great. So we had to like, and the small screen real estate. So we had to make adjustments like, you know, having them log in with a phone and with a computer. So a student would log in twice. So, and they could use um, basically one screen for um, audio if they needed to communicate and another one just purely to watch the video and the code. Um, an interesting one was Sarah said that live coding works. For us, it was actually not as good as I'd like and I'd liked it to be. Um, students asked us to do more code alongs where they'd watch us code and narrate what was happening and less try to give it a go themselves especially because when we had run it, we ran it as sort of the full two days. And it was just that little bit too much um, in terms of exa student exhaustion. So, what, and what worked also having a big team. So my math at the moment is at least plus one plus two. So if in my, like if in a normal workshop we have, let's say two or three instructors, then anything that we do in Zoom is plus one or plus two instructors, just to have them manage the hosting, the, the chat and sort of a lot of the operational sort of periphery of um, what's going on in the session. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. So just as, as a reminder, um, if you do have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or on the Etherpad. Uh, Kelly and I are monitoring that. So um, speakers, you don't have to feel as though you have to keep up with the questions. We'll make sure that they're going to be posed to you at the end. Um, okay. So we talked about what worked, um, what didn't work, what would you might do differently? I guess I can go first again <laughs> if nobody wants to. Um, so I guess installation problems were the biggest thing. Um, there, we, you know, tried to make sure everybody... I had to hold them for most of the last hour. Yeah, when you weren't holding them, I was. What was that? Oh, okay. Um, so installation problems were a big thing. And even though we send out the emails beforehand, like make sure you have admin privileges on your computer and make sure that, you know, you can install everything and run everything. We still had people that showed up like the day of with not having things installed. 
And um, one of the things we came in, we saw a problem. This is nobody um, who was teaching, none of the helpers and instructors had ever heard of um, Windows S mode. And one person had that in there. And so we had to kind of look and find out what that was. And then it's, it's basically a mode where um, the S is kind of very ambiguous. And some people think it stands for safety, speed. And it's really just for Windows. You can only use apps in their store. So you can't use Chrome. You can't use open source stuff, just things from a Windows store. And so it was kind of advising that person like, you know, and once you get out of S mode, you can't go back in. So it was like, well, you have to make this decision one way or another, you know, if you want to continue with the workshop. Um, and then there were just, um, you know, a lot of problems with um, people, um, one person, didn't have OpenRefine installed. And so if you in, try to help them install it while Zoom is actually going, it takes forever to install. So we had to ask them to like, you know, get out of the Zoom, um, uh, get out of the workshop and then install OpenRefine, you know, with the instructions we told them, then get back into the workshop. Um, because otherwise there's just, there's too much um, computer load on, the, on using both programs. Um, and like one of the things that um, I'm doing for this workshop coming up, and this is one of the, um, so this is something that came up in a discussion uh, session I was hosting and somebody tried this and they said it worked pretty well. And it was that everybody has to check in uh, with the organizer um, three days before um, the workshop and acknowledge that they have installed everything and everything runs smooth. And if it doesn't, then they have to con then they can contact me or another instructor and we'll um, help them install everything. And if they don't respond to emails about this or they don't get in touch with us, then they get dropped from the workshop and we put somebody from the wait list in. Um, so the workshop that we have next week, I'm meeting with the organizer like right after this. So, but she said that all the 20 people have, I think, gotten in touch with her in some form and have helped a couple of people with installation problems. So. Hopefully when we start on Monday morning that like everything should be running, everybody should be comfortable, everything should be installed. And that would kind of eliminate this huge problem because we had, um, yeah, I mean, I felt like each day there was, and we would reiterate at the end of each day, like, well, if you haven't installed um, Shell for tomorrow or Git Bash, um, that you need to do it. And we still ran into those problems. Um, but yeah, that was, I think, the biggest thing um, that we ran into was um, just installation problems and then trying to figure out just a new way to deal with that because it's much more difficult to deal with people remotely in Zoom than it is to like if you're in the same room and to kind of troubleshoot that. Um, we did have a couple other, um, you know, things that came up where helpers, you know, were able to um, uh, help with some problems when um, there were other issues that came up during um, the workshop. And those seem to go pretty smooth about handling them through um, the chat. But we had a, um, we had a Slack channel um, that was just for instructors and um, helpers to communicate through. And then um, we had um, the chat that um, the learners could use and then they could put things into the etherpad. Um, we would put things into the etherpad for them. And on one person, since they, couldn't um, access um, Zoom. And this was one of the persons who had the, um, the S mode. I actually had to do all my chatting with him to talk about this through the etherpad because he was signed up, but he wasn't in Zoom and he couldn't get in Zoom because it wasn't, I guess, it, they, he would have had to get out of Microsoft or Windows S mode. Um, so that was kind of, it was, it took a little while to get everybody, you know, all the helpers to get comfortable with all the troubleshooting and things that we were doing online, which was, again, much easier um, in person. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, you know, overall, like, um, you know, the workshops went great. We got good feedback. We had um, a couple people that actually, like, if you're in a workshop um, and you're in the same room, um, people like will, you know, stay in the room and, you know, that you, it's forcing them to like, you know, be a part of the workshop, even if let's say they're not getting it or something, or they want to leave. But we found that a couple people um, actually just left the workshop 
you know, they said something to us, like one person said to one of the, um, our helpers, like, oh, this is a great tool, but I don't know how I'll use it and just took off. Um, and then another person, when we noticed that they weren't putting up any of in the um, participants window, they weren't putting up any of the flags, like we would stop and we'd go like, so has everybody got this line of code running? How is everybody doing? And you put up like a yes or a no in there and they weren't responding to anything. And then the helpers were trying to respond to them and then they weren't, he wasn't getting back to them. And then at the end when the workshop was all over for the day, like it was, his screen was still there, but just black. And we were just like, did he just, you know, kind of bail, but leave his zoom on for the whole time to make it like he was there. Um, so there were kind of weird things like that where um, we noticed that it was much, um, sometimes people could just leave or that wouldn't be in the, you know, that's not something that would happen in a normal workshop. And for me, every workshop I've taught there, everybody has pretty much showed up and there's been a wait list. And when we, the two workshops I've been a part of, we had a lot of people that, I don't know if because they thought it was online that it was okay to bail or something, but um, we had wait lists and we still had people that, you know, the day of just six or seven people just didn't show up. So that was something new for me. Um, but those were, I guess that was, that was, those are the biggest problems we had. Um, and again, like trying to figure out a best way to um, take care of the installation problems and then kind of maybe, you know, like, again, we're making sure that, you know, now that we know what uh, Windows S mode is that, you know, that's going out in the email. Like if you have this, these, this is the, what you need to do. And if you don't want to, you know, get out of this mode, then you probably can't take the workshop because you won't be able to um, download any of the programs. And even on Windows S mode, you can't even get into the PowerShell that you, is on Windows 10 too. So um, yeah, that was probably the biggest problem. Okay, I'll go. Um, so since, and, and this connects pretty nicely with what Scott was saying, uh, because we didn't have a waiting list. Uh, so Metaosencia is like a new organization and everything is free and we don't ask anything in return of attendance <laughs> and we don't ask any prerequisites. You know, you know, you need to be able to speak speak Spanish, that's all, <laughs> and be interested in the topics. We do send uh, the program beforehand. I mean, it's all online, all is CC by 4.0. So every, we, we do share what we are going to be talking about in the workshop, of course. Um, but then after the initial enthusiasm among our personal networks <laughs> from the founders and, and, and friends, uh, the show up rate went started to go low and so we had like uh two instructors and a helper for six persons <laughs> and this is a volunteer-led thing so there's no way that we could have taught uh 500 people <laughs> in four months <laughs> while in lockdown while working <laughs> full time uh without you know if uh we we didn't pick up on that so we we had to change our registration form Calendly was super helpful and now we are having again uh, 20 people, 20 participants per session. And so that we, we had to change that, uh, but this might be different from different uh, from from what happens in Carpentry's workshops. But like if things are not working and people are not showing up to your thing uh, because it's free, uh, then rethink <laughs> and don't put ev all the whole human effort <laughs> for, you know, Teaching one on one, it's awesome, but it doesn't scale. <laughs> so, um, and then um, other than that, um, we it it was good that every I mean we have had people from all over America, yeah, like North, Central, and South America, and even some people from Europe that speak Spanish and don't have these contents. Uh, we we are focusing for now mostly in uh, the train the trainer. And so the instructor training from the carpentries. Um, and so we had all that reach, but of course it's a lot of effort from the group of volunteers that has been working, you know, growing because we, at the end we said, well, if you like this and you want this to scale, well, come join us. <laughs> uh, you just need to have had our, and, and we have blog posts that indicate what was the commitment expected. And, but this doesn't scale without any funding. Uh, it was like, I think uh, we can make yeah, it happen. Take a shower. 
so this doesn't scale without any funding and so we think we can make this uh, effort uh, as an exception for the pandemic until the end of the year at least i know i can keep putting the time until the end of the year and then it won't scale so um and and the same is similar with the rest of the volunteers that are uh, putting a lot of time into this so uh we are actively looking for additional international funding right now because you know <laughs> someone needs to fund us we were very lucky uh to have to be able we are uh, affording uh zoom and calendly thanks to a generous uh report scene of an award that was made to myself to uh to travel by the open bioinformatics foundation but other than that that's all the funding we have so far so yeah uh <laughs> these things need funding <laughs> that's the other thing that i would say that it doesn't work without funding uh and with that i'll i'll shut my mic so on the no shows front that both scott and laura brought up um yeah i we usually do workshops in person of about 40 people and i'd say there's like three or four no shows usually that don't show up and we actually charge uh people who are on our campus pay about 10 us dollars for a seat in our workshop and then outside they pay more and um we but we still get about three or four no shows and this is a policy we worked out we used to do them for free and then we got a lot of people not showing up and canceling last minute and we would pull them off the wait list and it was a lot of staff time like rearranging the wait list um, but so we decided to we have this new charging theme and now we're doing workshops online much smaller with about 15 people in the workshop uh, that we 15 seats that we open up and we still get maybe three or four people that don't show up at the beginning and I think also having it over time so we've spread them out so we're not doing two days at a time uh, we do a half day at a time instead um, so sometimes we're doing like every other day for a half day for like a week and a half and I think spreading it out also increases the drop off of people over time and I noticed that last year we did an in-person workshop where we split it up into uh, one day a week a half day a week um, for four weeks or actually we added an extra half day and we did five weeks but um, there was a huge drop off in the number of people who came from the first session to the last one and I think it's just that the semester gets busy and like that I, if the longer it goes on they're like ah, mid semester I have other things that I have to do and this is an optional thing so it's something that gets dropped um, and so no shows is kind of a problem as well um, I think I what I'm gonna do for that is actually start overbooking a little bit more so I'm gonna book for up to 20 instead um, um, and then if people don't show up, we'll have about the people I expected in the room. And but my the other thing I would say is expectations. I think people came in with a lot of expectations about what the workshop would be like. They didn't necessarily think that they were going to be live coding. We did an asynchronous version where, uh, for our last workshop where we had recorded videos ahead of time. And then they came for discussion sessions during the week. And the first day they were like, oh my gosh, I have to watch videos. And so they weren't surprised. They were surprised. I remember someone came into one of our live workshops and they were like, you're not doing recordings of the videos. I like recordings. And I was like, I'm sorry. Like, are, we're not ready for recordings yet. And so um, I think expectations, I'd say, is like kind of one of these things. And I'm still working out how to set them up with the right expectations that they're going to come up and come into the classroom and teach things. I read Daria's post before I did our first workshop, and that gave me a great way to give them expectations about how to lay out their screen. And we haven't had as many problems about laying out their screen. But I think making expectations clear, like whether you have to watch the videos ahead of time, if there's going to be videos, and a other workshop things. Actually, in our last instructor development meeting here locally, we had a suggestion that we put together like a video orientation to, hey, you're going to be using Zoom. This is what it's going to look like. Um, that you're going to be typing along with the instructor. This is what it's going to look like and have sort of a video orientation that they can watch ahead of the workshop so that they can be prepared with expectations. So I think that's something else we're going to work on to trying to have some sort of like preset this is what your expectation should be coming into the workshop video to to work on with that and i think that's um my major things that i can think of there are all sorts of little things that of course went wrong um one time we had an instructor accidentally close the zoom call she was the host and she hadn't really used zoom that much and i was i was actually teaching and she thought she was closing the breakout rooms but she closed the whole room and it went dark and i was like okay come back i had another meet uh, call where we ran into the using the same zoom room so our zoom room randomly disappeared for a second and then i was like no you can't have a meeting in here i'm teaching <laughs> um and so there were there's these things that come up that are technology and i think the thing there is to handle them with like 
calmness. It, it's easy to freak out when things go wrong. It's the same thing we tell people about error framing when they learn to teach is that don't panic. Like you have to you should have a backup system like your Slack channel and your Etherpad, so you be prepared. And then when those things happen, you you just you, you do what you can to make it right, and you be genuine with your learners, and they will they will understand it. So I think it's really great to follow on what Sarah said because I also realized I didn't share something that did work, and that's kind of important. So two things that did work is having a low bandwidth um, accessible place where learners know to go if like if your video chat dies which in our case we use google docs for that um, you can use etherpad you, i know people have used hackmd it's what it's whatever but you tell them that beforehand and you send it to them in your email link and you're like if everything goes down this is where you go to like figure, when we'll tell you what to do because my first thing that went bad was Zoom died on us because it got over, this was early days, so it just got the bandwidth just exploded. So like Zoom died and luckily it was on me, not one of my um, less, again, more sort of new to teaching instructors. So, so I was like, all right guys, this is fine. We'll, we'll go through this um, while eternally going, oh my God, but it was fun. Um, and also having a chat, asynchronous chat specifically for your instructor team. So like one that you can chat with your helpers separately to Zoom for two reasons. One, Zoom chat only allows one-on-one -on -one chats, which means you can't just send something to your team. And two, it's good to have a different app so you don't accidentally send your real comments to your students, which can be quite, um, sometimes you're like, oh my God, this is going bad. You don't want your students to know that. Um, I think something that, um, yes, we had interesting no-show or show rates. So we've had, like I had more no-shows for my onlines, but interestingly, Intersect, which is a big training organization for this kind of stuff here in New South Wales and Australia, they actually had better attendance rate at first. We think, they think because again, people really wanted training and that was all they could do. So like everyone has suddenly started coming. So, and again, I've linked to the videos where they talk more about this in the chat, in the etherpad. So um, for those of you that are interested, like that's 45 minutes of sort of different things they talk about, but Something else that didn't work for me was people popping in and out. So in a normal workshop, you've got them locked into a room, like they're in a room with you. They don't magically go out for a meeting for an hour, like in the middle of the workshop, like that doesn't tend to happen. They'll schedule it over lunch or something. Whereas we found that for our, like for our online training, even if it was like short, even if it was three hours, somebody would still schedule a half an hour meeting with a supervisor. And then they'd pop back in and you'd, and you'd have to try to bring them up to speed somehow, magically. And yes, all materials are online and all of the things, but that was still really hard. So that's something to be aware of. Um, again, two days don't work, um, which is hard because then you have, as what Sarah mentioned, the drop off in attendance. And I had actually pre-COVID also run multiple day trainings and also found that people drop off, but also people show up for day three and they're like, hi, I'm here. Can you teach me? And I'm like, you missed two days. Like this is six hours of content. I can't do that in five minutes. So that's definitely a challenge. Um, and having your materials online is the best like mini mitigation strategy, but there's not much you can do. Just again, accept and move on. I think another one is having limited learner feedback. So we actually explicitly ask learners to turn on their videos because we rely a lot on body language to see how people are going. And that's like getting, explaining that that's what you're using the video for. That's something that it doesn't work as much like as in a normal class, but it definitely helps. Um, especially I loved it. So I had this one student who had like his camera was pointing sideways at him and I could just see when he was hunting and working on the problem. I'm like, this is great. I love like this is my favorite student. I'm like, I can look at you and I know exactly how hard everyone is struggling. So it was like, it was amazing. Um, I think um, something else is the speed. So the speed of online teaching is slower. Like that's just something that we have, ex at least in our experience, we've accepted. And we've accepted that we need to, I don't know, I don't have a magic number, but maybe it's 70% of what you would do in an in, in, in person, which is still not as the full carpentry's workshop, but you get through, you may, if you're lucky, get through 70% of that online if you are lucky. And that, I mean, especially for some of our internal courses, that's really limiting because we get to the good stuff at the end. So like figuring that out. Um, something, as I mentioned, um, something else that didn't, um, go as well for us with networking. So something that I value in when we have an in-person workshop is st students talking to each other. And we try to, we kind of tried to emulate that by having one of us, either instructors or helpers, being there in like the morning tea and like in the breaks basically, and trying to foster that conversation with the students. Um, it was exhausting for us and I d it still didn't quite create 
the same dynamic. Um, and finally, I think, yeah, as I mentioned before, live coding didn't go quite well for us because learners said like, and they told us, uh, we set up an environment where they could tell us and they told us, we're like, you know what, we don't want to sit here typing. We don't like, this is just too much bandwidth. We want to watch you type and we want to ask you questions and that's all we're willing to do. And we're like, okay, we, we accept this. Um, and I think my personal, like, um, what I'd like to do, it's not something I've experimented with yet, but something I like to do is actually having some kind of a shared um, code base that they could edit together in a group as a challenge. Um, so they get at least some of that coding and debugging experience, um, but without sort of going every five minutes sort of switching to quite as many live codings as we normally do in a workshop. So, because for us, it's like probably the, sort of the 20% sort of talking at and then sort of 80% exercises. So it's definitely, um, something that we struggle with. Um, so something like co-coding, as I'd call it. Um, I think, so there were a few questions from um, Anajiat about um, sort of inter internet disruption. So again, Zoom went down for us, so that was a fun disruption. But other than that, yes, we had students who had trouble logging in, having them log in from a phone or multiple devices. Didn't fully ameliorate that, but that was something we tried. Um, intermittent availability, as I said, yes, big problem. Um, and it wasn't even at, only at home. We normalized specifically, like we had, I had a lovely learner who had kids literally climbing on her head. And I was like, that's great. That's amazing. That's really cute. Like, you know, don't be embarrassed. I want to support you like, cause you're here to learn. And you know what? It's like, you know, I get it. We're all sitting at home. Like I've got a three-year-old. We're sitting at home with the toddlers on our head. Yes. Um, so I think uh, changes in participants level of participation, definitely. But again, you have that in an in-person as well. Like in an in-person, you're also going to have the prof who's going to check his email in the afternoon because grants are due. And like, this is, this is just, I think it's when you're teaching adult learners, you, I tend to respect that. I'm like, if you think that checking your email right now is more important to you, okay. I'll ask you if you'd like, if you know, would you like something or anything? I can see that, but I won't totally be like, you know, oh my God. Um, and yeah, duration of different parts of workshop, again, make it shorter somehow. And I think modular, short, self-contained stuff would be the way to go. My personal, like what I'm doing differently is I've actually, I've put off running some of our longer trainings and I'm working to develop some like short one and a half hour modules at the moment, which are much more talking at, much more like you can run this code yourself, but I'll work you through it. So it's things like we're trying to do our markdown for research and sort of um, more, um, maybe some, you know, get in GitHub for stuff, but really things that are more um, self-contained, short and tiny. So that like, because right now that's what our learners are more responsive to, we found. So I think, yeah, that's, that's sort of the what didn't work and how we're doing sort of different things now. Okay, so we have 15 minutes before we open it up to the floor. However, I have been grabbing, grabbing those questions. So we're going to ask a couple people, and you can, uh, the next couple of questions, um, you've actually kind of answered some of them. The next question we're going to talk about particularly is the, um, the breakout rooms. How did you use them if you did? How did you do that? But also, um, let's start thinking ahead. Um, and if we can get a couple of the, um, couple of the panelists think about, you know, if there's a burning question or, or burning answer that you want to provide to um, in mitigating the content of the workshop online, what did you learn? Um, what resources did you use prior to the workshop? Um, and again, I think some we've answered that one a little bit. And then what were the, uh, some of the, were there any asynchronous portions? So if you like, we can kind of use those questions. Uh, you can kind of answer some of them all together, but we want to make sure that we do touch on those, but make sure we allot the full 30 minutes for everyone to answer the questions, okay? So um, we'll start off with Scott talking about the breakout rooms. And if you want to throw some of your answers to the other part in there, feel free, but be mindful that we have 15 minutes. Yeah, so with breakout rooms, what we did is we used it kind of at the start for introductions. And so people could kind of, um, you know, see other people and realize that they're in an actual like workshop with other people. And then one of the things that I've been, we've been using breakout rooms are at the end for. And so in the last year, um, I've been teaching some library carpentry workshops with Ariel Deerdorf, and she had this great idea that at the end, the last day of all our workshops, that we have like 40 minutes that we dedicate to um, 
having everybody kind of talk about how they would use all the different resources and they put it into the etherpad um, and um, just really like how would they use everything they've learned and how it applies to like what they're doing. And so with the breakout rooms when we did this online is we had, you know, people in breakout rooms and then they discuss like, you know, everything they kind of learned over the um, last couple days and then how they would use it and then they put it into the etherpad and then they came out of the breakout rooms and then we you know talked about people would talk about like you know how this would work and i think that's very important to like kind of people learning these things and even when people like might think like how would i use the shell and then somebody's like oh this would be great so when i get a bunch of files i can just do a head and i can see like you know what's at the start of the file or like what are all the like different of a csv file what are all the like you know headers and stuff like that so um, I think that was great how we use breakout rooms. Um, in putting content into the workshop, I'm mitigating the content, is that I found that I use some slides when I'm teaching and there were other times like when I was teaching live, I would use like um, the whiteboard or whatever is in the room to like talk about this is kind of how, what an array is and stuff like that. I think it's much easier to kind of have a picture of it. And so that I found that I had some slides that I would throw in to kind of illustrate some of the things, the mental concepts we might be talking about in programming when they're coming up. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, again, another thing is like the first part of the workshop is really about like introducing everybody to Zoom and how they're going to interact with um, everybody and Zoom. So like one of the things like teaching slower is important, but it's also to have that participants window up and like kind of monitor like, you know, just like sticky notes, like when people are responding, like, you know, yes, yes, no, no. And if, um, and if a helper sees that somebody's just not responding to personally go into a chat and contact them and be like, hey, are you okay? Are you falling behind? What's going on? How can I help you? Um, so that was kind of one of the things is, um, is to really look at like, you know, the sticky notes. And then at the end of every day, you know, where you get the sticky note feedback from everybody, you know, there's the, you know, make sure to have them fill out the, um, the Google form or whatever you want to create so you can get feedback, like what, what did you like today and what didn't you like, just like you would in a real workshop. Um, and then um, I guess was that, the, the other resources, I think, what, was that, was that all the questions? Did I miss something? Um, no, you covered them all. Okay, all right, great then. I'll leave it to the next person to talk. Okay, uh, breakout rooms are the favorite feature of MetaLessensia's audience. I mean, they, it's even if we are getting now people that already use Zoom, at the beginning, people hardly knew Zoom mid-March, uh, but then now everyone has used it at least once, no, no matter how remote, <laughs> remotely located they are. And we do get people that are really remote in the middle of nowhere, but uh, they all knew, know uh, Zoom, but they haven't been exposed to breakout rooms yet, most of them. So it surprises our audiences every time because like we are doing this three hour workshop uh, that um, we send people into the breakout rooms so they can discuss between them. And we even had people saying, well, I'm in lockdown alone and this is the best conversation I had in a month. <laughs> so we, we allow them 10 minutes to uh, meet and greet and discuss how they could make uh, their, their classes active. Active learning is not something ma very much used uh, in Latin America throughout like any level of education. Uh, I mean, it's like very expository uh, kind of thing. So they they just uh, tell us, well, you know, I never learned in this way, so I couldn't teach in this way. Uh, <laughs> so we, we get all that kind of conversations. And even in the end of workshop survey, we, we do use it. Uh, we, we keep the last minutes for that. And, and people uh, leave us great feedback there. And they always, they also said, we need, tell me how you did the breakout rooms. I really need the breakout rooms. <laughs> tell me how to use that. So we already piloted a two hour Zoom workshop uh, that went very well, where we give people the host power and they kind of, uh, and, and they are super happy. So we, we hope to be teaching that, uh, building upon the previous model. So we, we are making this uh, initial model so they, we can, uh, put other models uh, after it, but in independent. And then um, 
we all learned, I, I'm going to skip the migrating content online. We really did everything. Um, the, the resources we use is like, we've been part of the carpentries online already uh, because I've been in, uh, most of us are from Argentina, Metal Sensia, so everything we've learned, it's been online from the carpentries. So we are using all that experience <laughs> from the carpentries from pre-COVID uh, to do the online thing and also we we have done a lot of online activities with Our Ladies Global and Our Ladies chapters all over the world. So we have experience from that and practice and also for our community Latinar, the Latin American uh, Conference for our, uh, for Research and Development. And so finally, we do have asynchronous portions uh, because internet, let's put it briefly, sucks here. I mean, like <laughs> people get disconnected all the time. So what we have three components, asynchronous components. Um, we do participa uh, participatory uh, teaching and everyone, the idea is that they are in synchronous as much as, as, much as they can. So they can do, uh, learn by doing, okay? Experience what is going on. And that's why we call ourselves meta. And so they, they really, we, we tell them what to do and they get to experience it. <laughs> so um, that we do have uh, many blog posts uh, on, on different things that we don't cover. We do invite them to our Slack. Uh, we have a community Slack where they can keep being in contact and doing the networking. It's not the same as being in person, of course, but still people are there and we share frustration and we share happiness and we share everything. <laughs> so that's a, and the Slack is key. And the Slack is not a tool very much. Uh, I mean, WhatsApp is the thing in the region, mostly, or Telegram or Facebook, but then people learn to appreciate Slack. So, and finally, we did, uh, we do have a YouTube channel where, where we have uh, one or two versions of the workshop recorded for people that got disconnected and need to see asynchronous. We, we say it's not ideal. This is not the way we would, would recommend, but okay, you have it there and go watch it. And, and, and the, the video online has as many <laughs> as, uh, watches as our attendance. So, like we cover twice as many people by that. It's so ideal. And okay. I'm gonna bundle my answer for breakout rooms and online workshops in that I think the most important things is thinking about how to present your exercises. Cause um, I think that like you can use breakout rooms to present exercises. I have a rule of thumb that's like, if we're not, if they're not gonna be in it for 10 minutes, it's not worth the transition in and out of breakout rooms. Um, but when they're there, like having good directions, um, ha thinking about how you could modify the exercises. Cause a lot of them, uh, kind of assume you're in person even like somewhat implicit like kind of secretly and you don't even notice until you go to do it and then you're like oh this doesn't quite fit as easy um and so uh thinking about how to do your exercises i i saw one of our instructors who bundled several of the exercises together and put them into put in, her learners into breakout rooms so that they could work through those exercises together as a as a team um and so thinking about how you can change the exercises slightly so that they like are a little bit better for this online format or put like how you might use breakout rooms for discussion and activities um, I think is is vital um, for for presenting this online. And then we also did asynchronous portions of the workshop for our, our geospatial workshop, which we had last week, actually, and that's um, that was the first time we had done anything asynchronous and we took inspiration from a flip classroom sort of. So they watch videos ahead of time. Um, we recorded the videos and then they came for discussion sessions in person. So we had an hour discussion session every day and we had it at two different times so we could accommodate to the time zone variations. And we had the learners, they were expected to watch a certain subset of the videos for each day and that's what the content of the, the discussion session was going to be and we didn't i admit plan out what our live sessions were going to be exactly because we'd never done that before when we went into it and you could see kind of the way they evolved through the week in that at first we were 
like not quite sure. We did some breakouts at the beginning and then we had a lot of review in the first two sessions of the videos. And then we stopped doing as much review as we went on and we'd have a short review at the beginning and then do extra challenges and have them talk about discussion points like what is a CRS is really a big thing in the geospatial workshop, right? And so uh, having them talk about these things uh, and they we got really amazing feedback from the learners. We had them give us feedback every single day and then we asked them specifically if they liked the format. And we got a lot of really good feedback that they loved watching the videos separately and coming to these discussion sessions. Someone who was like, I'm a parent and I couldn't have set aside like three hours to do the live synchronous workshops during the day. Like that just would have been impossible for me. I really liked being able to watch the videos on my own schedule and then come for this one hour session during the day. Um, and I think the biggest cha changes we noticed were really that um, we didn't tell them enough in advance about the, how watching the videos and the prep for that, and we we're definitely going to change that. And then planning those in-person workshops uh, sessions a little bit more is, I think, our goal. Interestingly, though, our instructors were loved it so much and were so interested in it that after the workshop, they were like, let's continue to work on this, Sarah. We want to make more videos for the R sessions that we didn't record. We want to improve the in-person sessions. They like came up with this list and they wanted to start meeting again right away, even though we may not run this workshop again for a year. So Eric, it's, it's, a, it's a fun way. So I think that's a really interesting like result and I like I'm kind of really curious to talk more about it because so I mean I'll start with the breakout rooms and then go to asynchronous but so breakout rooms definitely we use them as well. Yes, we batched exercises, we gave group tasks, we made and I think we in some of our workshops we had enough that we could have an instructor or helper in each room and in some we didn't. And I think my magic number for how many people in a breakout room is about 4 because that gives them and everyone enough time to contribute. Um, and so, so I think that that's like the magic number for no one is quiet in that room. If you, once you go to five and six, I feel like one person can still sort of slink away and be quiet. Whereas if you throw four people, they seem to all talk. Um, I don't know why. Uh, but definitely giving, some, like, and also giving time for icebreakers, giving time for people, like we asked people in the participants channel to label, like to name their faculty, because again, across all faculties of the uni, and we did try to make breakout rooms, like that were more discipline specific, so people could actually go and hang out with other people who might work in their faculty or like their wider sort of area. In an in-person class, they'd kind of naturally do that, and they'd also meet people from other faculties, but you know, we sacrificed the other faculties for online to make it sort of more about local, more localized community building. Um, and yeah, giving clear instructions in the breakout rooms, reminding of those instructions, so sending the message in the chat to everyone. Um, I think Anna Jiat asked about, um, you can see who's in the breakout rooms and none of the learners are left alone. You can see who's in the breakout rooms and you, they generally, you will see them all pop out of the main session. So also I did talk about this in my blog post, but as an instructor, I also log in through multiple accounts to the same Zoom. So I have like my Daria one version is actually still in the main room, whereas Daria like the actual person goes into a room, but I can see on another computer who's in the main session. So like, again, the luxury of having multiple computers um, for their work. But um, if you do have access to that, that's a really like helpful to, for, for your own like management of Zoom. It actually works really well. Um, and uh, what else? So I think about um, everyone like, explaining how to join a breakout room, people have mostly gotten it, so that's um, not too hard on it yet. I think um, in the breakout rooms, really also accepting the fact that people will go off and have tang tangential conversations and that's okay. Like that's, that's another like breakout room is yeah, it's fine. I think, um, and sort of, yeah, they, they work, but they slow you down as well. So you need to be strategic about how many of them you plan because they do slow you down quite a bit with, in terms of like um, sending everyone out, then bringing everyone back, then sort of moving on. It's, it does change the pace quite a bit. Um, I think in terms of asynchronous, we actually haven't gone asynchronous yet. And I don't know, like Zara's is, like, example right now is making me tempted to try it. But the reason we haven't gone asynchronous is because one of the most valuable experiences of this, and I think something Laura's also mentioned is, a lot of people are sitting in lockdown. A lot of people are, and I mean, in Melbourne, we're going into another, people have gone into another lockdown. So this is also right now a form of social connection. It's a form of just, you know, being together um, for what we've got. So having that, um, sort of fostering that, um, 
I don't like an asynchronous, like I don't know how to guarantee that people will watch the video if some people do and some people don't. Sort of having the challenge of what do you do in that case? Um, how, how do you support them? Like what sort of, it's um, tricky. And I have done, again, in previously, like when I thought of sort of for our, even a pre-COVID, um, I actually did a teaching degree last year and I looked at, I did a few student interviews, the so learner interviews, they weren't students, they were like, some of them were profs, but whether or not they would engage with content for like watch a video before coming to an in-person workshop and a lot of them were like no you know what? i want to come to two days and that's it that's all the time i have and i don't know if you know adding this video modularity might make it more accessible or you know it's just going to make it less accessible i don't know um i think but the other thing about recording though is recording a session with actual students uh, it's something that we haven't done and i we haven't done by design because we want our learners to be comfortable telling us everything, which includes off, sometimes, not often, but like, you know, things that we don't necessarily want, you know, we want to make them feel comfortable. Things like, you know, this isn't working, like, please stop live coding. Like that was, that was not something that I'm really comfortable having, like sharing around. So when you, after you record it, you sort of lose a little bit of control over that video and sort of that, um, what happens to that. Um, and it's it's less safe for you. It's less it's less like I'm I guess I'd be okay with it But again, I have trainee instructors who work Who I'm supporting and sort of managing their training aspect of their role and I don't know if they like they're already they, I can see that they're already challenged by teaching having their teaching then recorded is going to stress them out so much more so I like we've consciously made the decision for both our instructor well-being and learner well-being not to record and also um, it's kind of like, it's challenging to like, even in, even in online, we do pivot to the class we have, so we can slow down, we can speed up, we can answer questions. We can do sort of, we work with the cohort we have after you've recorded a lot of learners, like we know this, they'll just go and watch your video from like a previous session instead of thinking of attending themselves. And the, like, it's a much more passive way of accepting, of adopting that information. So I like, I'm hesitant to record even for the learners who were in the like even for the learners who were in the class we haven't really done that that much um and yeah well well being stressed like it's just we'd rather just run a few more of them and yes you know see how it goes um so yeah asynchronous i i like I'm, i'll talk to sarah offline more about how that's gone and what you've done because for us async has just been people aren't willing to watch anything beforehand but I don't know yet how to work with that or around that. So, all right, thank you, everybody. That was really great. Uh, so now we're going to go into questions. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of shoot these at you, and you guys can take them. Whoever feels like they have an answer, and I'm going to start with the questions that are in the either pad. So how can we facilitate online group, group work among the students, given the realities of unstable internet connection? And it would be difficult to visit all of the breakout rooms while trying to have meaningful, helpful presence in each of the breakout rooms. So this kind of relates to what we were just talking about. I can't answer the issue about internet connectivity because I feel like we're pretty lucky in that most of our learners have pretty good internet connectivity and um, same for our instructors. Um, but the breakout room portion is what, one of the things we've done is actually assign a helper to each uh, breakout room and then they can they can facilitate conversation, they can answer any questions about the challenges um, and they're kind of there for you to, to help answer questions in the breakout rooms. When I don't have helpers, I usually poke my head into each breakout room because as a host you can jump into the different breakout rooms and so I'll kind of poke my head in. I usually turn my video off so that they don't immediately go like, oh, Sarah's here. Um, but I turn my video off, poke my head in, and then I, most of the times I find that there's a lot of discussion going on and they're, they're talking about the subject I've, I assigned them to talk about. So it, it's been working pretty well. Yeah. Oh, good, Aria. Okay. Okay. Um, I think one of the, so as I said, we, internet connectivity, we have had some issues with students, especially learners overseas or learners who are remote. Um, and so having the alternative communication method, whether that's a Google Doc or something else, 
um, like that learners know to go to to also tell us like I'm having an internet problem. That's they, they know that that's they can also tell us that there. Um, I think for some of the other of like another option um, is that we definitely tell them that if especially once we have the little group, the learning group, if some people in that like start having problems and they want to build that network and sort of keep going so not necessarily in the session but going forward we definitely tell them to use whatever communication channel is comfortable for them so i know that when we had again a couple of learners in china we said you know what if wechat works better for you to like talk amongst yourselves it's um and fine we can and we, you can reach out to us sort of as well so um i think like asking what asking what works asking what the students have access to um, and asking what what would be comfortable for them um, and I think in terms of yeah breakout rooms that so we don't know like we don't always have someone in the help with we can have helpers sometimes in all the rooms but not always um, and I think it's like lots of that spamming messaging of like reminders you know this is now five minutes this is this thing this task and also clearly saying who's designated to report back from the room. So every room has a learner who's responsible for sort of summarizing their key outcomes, whether it's for a challenge task, sharing the result, or um, sort of for discussion questions, sharing their key points, um, and varying who that person is. So if you keep the rooms consistent, you vary the person in it. So um, sort of making it really different. And yeah, giving time for an icebreaker as well to get people in the breakout rooms actually comfortable with each other. Um, so Scott. Yeah, I will say one of the things, and this is about the connectivity issue. And like I said, we had somebody who had this, I think Windows S mode and they couldn't even get into Zoom. And so they were communicating with us on the etherpad because when we sent out like the email, and I think when you send emails out to um, uh, learners now, it's like, you make sure like have everything installed and you know make sure that you have admin pr privileges, get back to us if you don't if you're having problems installing anything, but also like, you know, um, this is the, um, the, the, the etherpad is how we can, inter we can talk with one each, with each other, sorry. And then uh, kind, of, kind of laying out a lot of the stuff in the workshop and how it will go in that email so that they kind of have it beforehand. And so one of the things, Daria, is I, I've sent out your blog post that you did about what to expect as being a learner. And I think that kind of, when they're reading this email about they've signed up and they're getting ready for the workshop that that's kind of one of the things in there is like this is how the workshop will go and so they can kind of feel a little bit more prepared for it um another thing is like is when you're doing breakout rooms if you can ha like we have like the workshops we haven't there haven't been more than 20 people that's what we cap it off at and the last workshop we have actually overbooked at 25 because we thought we'd have like some people drop off and we had like 15 end up showing up but we have it, we made sure that we had enough helpers and along with the instructors that the breakout room size could be, we could have a helper or an instructor go into those breakout rooms to like kind of um, facilitate them, you know, answer questions, things like that too. Um, I will only mention um, about connectivity issues that we have had a ton of those, but people keep coming back. The need is so huge that they just don't give up. They, I mean, <laughs> they keep, and, and we have the helper, you know, helpers, uh, well, one helper, you know, just trying to reach out to each person that has a problem. We also have the pre-workshop uh, survey where we ask about connectivity. I mean, how is your connect, your internet connection? And so we monitor and which, and we read that feedback before, right? <laughs> so uh, we, we do have the list of names of people like, may have problems so we pay special attention we also have some people with uh, disabilities that are joining and so we also pay attention to that uh, and and try to be mindful of those issues as well so um, but people keep keep trying even there's a waiting room for our workshops and they keep <laughs> joining even when disconnected because they need this so that's my two cents on this that's great so we talked about how content ch is different on these online workshops, but this question is maybe a little bit different. How should your teaching style vary while transitioning to, to teaching online? So is there anything you haven't talked about yet about how teaching online is different? May I? Um, 
I just, my only advice is active teaching, please do active teaching. <laughs> you, I mean, it, uh, they more than ever, like the advice that you, uh, that uh, the carpentry instructor training is like, send them to do an exercise every, you know, five uh, concepts, you know, or seven, uh, seven plus minus two. Remember that part if you're an instructor? So they need to go to a share our document or do something every, you know, otherwise you're gonna lose them. So the, the, the share document or the activities or the breakout rooms, that keeps your attention and the, it must be active. There's no way you can keep talking for 50 minutes and, and, and keep people engaged here. So those are my two cents on that. Does anyone else want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I'll say that um, one of the things when teaching is, like we've mentioned before, is going slower. Um, but also, um, you know, I think, and I agree with uh, Laura about like, you know, um, putting people in the breakout rooms and kind of not just kind of, you know, talking to them. But also, like, one of the things, and this sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, um, but like, when I think about like I'm teaching like at a normal cl class, like if I'm doing something we've already talked about and I might say like, okay, so what will we do to do this? And then, you know, somebody from the audience would just say, oh, that's this command or whatever. I still try to do that. And sometimes it's like, you know, avoid nobody says anything. But I've noticed that when you, after the first day, the second day, like people will start to get like familiar with everybody. And you'll notice that in the chat, sometimes there'll be little, you know, comments or jokes that weren't there the first day. People tend to like kind of get more relaxed and that you're in a group and then they could, they will actually start kind of giving you an answer like that. Um, so, I mean, the far as teaching style, I'm still kind of figuring this out to tell you the truth. Like I've only taught twice online um, and I feel it's, really difficult and I don't find it nearly as satisfying as being in a room and meeting the people at the breaks, talking to people. Um, there's just like the disconnect is still kind of there and it's trying to find a way to kind of bridge that I think is the most important thing that I'm still struggling with and trying to deal with. Um, and I'm trying to teach more online to kind of get better at this and hopefully I can feel you know more of a connection but I think that's kind of the hardest thing that I've had to deal with. Um, and I've tried, you know, you know, it's again, it's only been two times next week, I'm teaching another workshop, and I'm gonna try to like, see how we can get more people more involved and feel like, you know, it's, we're having a, we're actually communicating and I'm not just, you know, doing live coding in front of them. Yeah, I think Scott brings up a really great point, And that's something that I hear from, like, we've taught a number of workshops, I think we have had like 10 instructors, pretty much every single one of them has been like, the hardest thing was not getting feedback from the learners, um, not being able to see them, not being able to like interact with them. It's really different. And myself, I've been doing instructor training online for about a year and a half. And then I've done maybe five or six half day sessions teaching as the primary teacher online. And I think I'm only finally starting to get comfortable with like staring at myself while I teach instead of staring at everyone else. And I still don't really like it, but I think it's starting to get more normal to me. So I, I've saying hopefully that will happen for you that you'll start to feel like this isn't so like so painful and I think I don't know I still like there's ways to interact with the students it's definitely more reduced um, but um, there's still a little bit of connection that can be still kind of nice I think the only thing I can add to that is also online so in, in, a, in a person workshop you sort of have the people that really want to engage with you. And then the people who are sort of on the periphery and then the people who are sort of like the profs who are half the time checking their email and you know, like they're not gonna like sort of, so, and you have this, like you have a class dynamic. So you really talk to them, they answer back like this, this thing's got all good. Like you have a dynamic, you set up a dynamic usually by the afternoon of the first day. There, 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 is, there is a, like it's, and you obviously try to spread it around, but it's still gonna be quite um, like you build that rapport, you build that. Online, it's like I have to. I find I have to be more explicit about it. So I use Gallery View on Zoom. I try to look at my students. I try to see what they're doing, and I try to 
without calling on them necessarily, but because again, they come from different faculties and I asked them to label that in the participants list. I try to make funky questions, which are like, I'd say more relevant for business or more relevant for law. So that person is more likely to tell me something. It's quite, again, this is why I say we adapt the workshop to the students. It's quite contrived, but I try. And that's sort of the best, the best I've been able to come up with to try to sort of model that, um, uh, that in-person sort of dynamic interaction that you get, it's not the same. And I agree with, it's definitely like, I find it a lot harder to teach online and a lot less emotionally satisfying. Like emotionally, it's just more draining than satisfying. Yes, I admit this, but it is the world we live in. It's, it's what we're doing. And we're gonna keep doing it because it does make training accessible for people who otherwise wouldn't have access. But yeah, it's like, there, there, it's, it's not going to be the same and it's not easy, I think is what I want to say. The next question we have is about how can we assess learners when we're online? One way uh, that came up, we, we do teach in the three hour thing, we teach uh, concept maps and, and people get to do one and upload it uh, with like, they are cameras, people that are not familiar with technology. They, we get them to do it uh, in the first hour and they, they start saying, I can't, no, this is, this is beyond me. And then most of them do, or finally they send it to us uh, on an, to an email account. <laughs> we even have people holding the, the thing uh, on camera and taking a picture and making a screenshot uh, on our side. So we, we've learned the, the first time we did it, we didn't have a plan and it was like, oops, <laughs> we didn't think about this. <laughs> but then <laughs> there, there have been a lot of oops moments that I didn't talk about. <laughs> but, um, but then, so the concept map, it's uh, really good for evaluation uh, because like people told us afterwards in the Slack in MetaLocencia, like that concept map that you taught me to prepare my classes, uh, now I'm using for evaluation. And it's, it seems it's, a, I mean, it's unique. People cannot, I mean, there's no two concept maps that are equal. So people really need to reflect on that. It takes time to grade though. Uh, so no, no silver bullet. I feel like from ours, we're not really doing any sort of formal assessment. Um, and it's more about the feedback we get from the learners about how they're doing um, and getting, getting, having them participate in challenges and write what they're going to use it for in the etherpad and those kinds of um, activities where they think about their own learning and continue to do that and giving them the opportunity for metacognition um, to ass assimilate what they're learning and then tell us about it, I think is, is the only kind of real assessment that we're doing. Um, it's not not really the formal assessment of like pass fail. Um, I feel very lucky not to have to grade anyone, to be honest. Yeah, I guess like you know the assessment. Um, it's kind of like when you're when you're teaching and you have the sticky notes, and I think it's you know you, you're asking questions and people are putting yes or no in the participant windows. And if you notice that somebody is just not answering or something, to have helpers go in and try to figure out what's going on. They could have just left the workshop, they, you know, but it's, you know, that's kind of like trying to get as much feedback during the workshops as you can. And like, you know, at the end of, you know, again, when we've been teaching too, they haven't been two day workshops. They've just been, you know, um, a few hours in the morning. Um, the workshop I'm doing next week is, it's five hours a day, but it's two hours in the morning, then a lunch, then two hours we're coming back. So it's really just two hour increments. Um, and this is the university want to do that way. So we're gonna see how it works. But um, to get like, you know, feedback at the end of every session from the forums, just how they're doing, like, you know, it, are you going too fast? Or are, are things, you know, feeling good to the um, learners? Um, and, you know, at the end, when you have the, the big post workshop survey to really look at that, and that's where I always try to like, you know, learn from that, like, if there was somebody who said something, you know, and I was like, oh yeah, that didn't really work with them, like really think about it. Um, a lot of the times when you get assessment, you'll have some person saying like, what you did was awesome. And some other person saying, I didn't like which, the way you did it that way. And so it kind of, you get conflicting messages like, you know, so sometimes it's like, um, it's hard to really assess how you're actually teaching, but really 
really paying attention to the learners during the whole workshop and, you know, having uh, helpers look at how they're doing, making sure that you're, you know, paying attention to them, I think is like how you can assess how the workshop's going into really every day after the workshop, you know, look at the sticky note surveys they gave and, you know, see if you can make changes the next day if there's some problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question was specifically to Laura and she's already provided a really nice answer in the either pad. But so I, what I'm thinking is maybe we'll broaden it. So the question was, how do you shorten existing modules? But you guys all talked about how there's, we have to teach less content when it's online. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how you make those decisions and how you figure out what you're going to teach and what you're going to cut. Uh, well, I, we have, be, we are very, very mindful of people's time and, and we make sure to follow our, our content. So we had the freedom in Metal Sensia to do uh, new stuff, right? We, we don't have to follow the carpentries. Uh, so there's, uh, we don't have the backup, <laughs> but then uh, we are free to do whatever we want, right? I mean, we, we don't have an institution behind. <laughs> so we do as, and, and we have uh, be very respectful and mindful of people's time. It's always three hours. And if you go, I, I think I pasted uh, our thing there. Yeah, and it's in English. That we that one we have uh, bilingual. So if you, uh, it's, it's not only in Spanish. And if you see, we have like minute by minute what we are doing and we stick to it. I mean, we practiced <laughs> and, and, and we, give, we gave enough time to people. I mean, we, we know our personas. The learner personas are also the other thing that are, I mean, we, we had to think and we've been learning, of course, and we've been adjusting. And, and we have discovered that different instructors have a little bit of a different uh, way of doing this, but we stick in a very, very like religious and fun of timing. And, and you know, we, we don't try to teach more than we can fit in three hours or that would overwhelm our people, like keeping like the five plus minus, uh, the seven plus minus uh, two, you know, and, and uh, it's like, following what we learn at the carpentries it's essential here folks <laughs> sorry <laughs> i think another sorry i'll continue i don't know if we have an order but the i think another thing that we definitely do in terms of what to keep and what to leave is having your materials online in some format so having all of the stuff that you're going to teach accessible online so for us that's on a github enterprise pages that's hosted for sydney uni for like closed content that's um specific to some of our internal training and obviously all of the carpentries materials that we use are online and explicitly pointing students to that multiple times throughout the workshop so and that way and then you basically so that's like this is the entire like module we're never gonna get through it being upfront about that and then saying we're going to go over these topics which we think are key and then you're choosing the bare minimum of essential topics. So for, again, um, that might mean we don't do some interesting machine learning algorithms for machine learning courses, but we do like, we do basically enough that somebody can take a data set and go through with it and try at least one algorithm and understand what it's doing. Um, so that, cause the rest of them are basically different algorithm, but same way of assessing what's going on and implications. So really making, identifying what is the fundamental minimum like what's the minimum you need to learn to be able to do what you want to do? Yes, learner personas. And that's what, that's how you answer. What do you want to do? And then making sure we get through that well, like work through that well. And for the students that want more, for the students that are more advanced, for the students who aren't satisfied with that, making sure the materials are accessible online and we're explicit upfront and redundant about pointing to them. So they can like, you know, go and look at them when they're ready, when they want to, and when they need to. So yeah, that. I think Daria said it better than me, but one thing I will add is um, that it's so I, I think it's okay if you don't get to everything and you can always point them to the online online lessons. Um, now I'm losing my own train of thought. <laughs> um, the the other thing is, is that I like to pepper throughout kind of the motivation to like consider as you're teaching them, maybe you don't get to always to get to the super exciting part at the end of the lesson, um, but to talk about why that's really exciting earlier on and how you use that tool in your own work and what 
they could do with this tool if they finish the lessons on their own or um, those kinds of things that are in the things you may not get to or motivating them kind of keeps them hanging on to the end or or has them more interested in going to follow up later and so that's one of the motivation tricks that i try and i try to include in my teaching thank you i want to jump in and get one more question in because i think a lot of people are wondering about it uh how do you guys use helpers i feel like everyone's kind of worried about how to make helping work um i'll i'll start um really it's it's um making sure everybody has a defined role and meeting beforehand um the first time we taught we actually got all the helpers and teachers together and we took turns playing teacher playing learner playing helper and how zoom works and all the different ways we can do things and felt comfortable with it um but one of the things it's like with any other carpentry um if you're teaching um in the same room you get everybody together and you talk about you know make sure that every all the helpers you know if they're going to be there they might not be there for the full workshop they might be there for like certain lessons make sure that they understand those lessons and they know how to troubleshoot and if they have any questions for you you know talk to them about that and um so a lot of times the helpers it's the first time they've actually been to a carpentry's workshop um you know and so you kind of lay out like you know how it's going to go um what the pedagogy is what it's like um, if they've already attended them, then they're more experienced. You don't have to go in depth about things, but really to make sure everybody's on the same page. And like I said earlier, like when we get together, we'll be like, okay, this morning, you're going to be, the, who's going to be monitoring, you're going to be monitoring the chat. You're going to be monitoring um, the etherpad and taking some notes, putting things in there. Um, you know, we have the Slack channel. We communicate to say, hey, can you check on Steve? You know, he hasn't put up a sticky note in a while. And so it's really about making sure that everybody is coordinated and understands kind of what they're doing and they feel comfortable going in. Like you want the helpers, because they might not be the most experienced people with the carpentries to just feel like really comfortable going in and that you have their back. Yeah, to add to what Scott is saying, uh, we don't work, we don't let uh, someone help that is not experienced enough uh, at all. So again, we are our own small little starting organization and we, we have learned over time on how to work together. So someone that joins the team, we, we don't know each other. I mean, we, we have new people. It's not people that have worked for a long time, but they have first to make the workshop, then they have to uh, be uh, with another helper. We even have a blog post on how to do this. And we have a share a, an internal document where you know all the needs throughout the workshop are detailed. Uh, so, and we don't let people, I mean, we encourage people to start teaching because the idea is like, you know, making uh, more people uh, teach uh, and become instructors and everything, but we don't, we don't push them if they don't feel comfortable doing it. Uh, so each each person at its own time, it's all volunteer. So <laughs> we don't want to lose people. And it has, uh, we have learned also to um, divide our, our work and, and 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 be very clear on which if there's more than one helper uh which is rare but it sometimes happens so so you take care of the waiting room and i'll take care of starting and if someone doesn't have the audio it's my thing i mean chatting over zoom it's a nightmare as, and, and we do have a whatsapp channel as a parallel way <laughs> which works in any phone so even if you know uh, we get disconnected uh it, it's for internal use we don't have something as daria was saying for the for for our audience and we need never had a problem before but it's something we're gonna have to think about now thank you very much all right, well, I think that's our time. Uh, so I, first, I just wanted to take a minute to really thank our panelists. Thank you so much, Sarah, Scott, Laura, and Daria. We really appreciate your willingness to experiment and for ex sharing those experiences with us. Uh, with the help of our instructor community, we at the Carpentries have also been putting together resources to help you guys teach online and make that easier and more effective. So if you haven't seen it yet, we recently were able to release version two of our recommendations for teaching carpentry workshops online. Uh, if you haven't looked yet, we've added a whole lot more information. So go take a look at that. 
And I was going to put a link into the Etherpad, and now I don't know where, where that link is. Let me grab that. Um, but in the meantime, um, we want to keep hearing from you. Like everything we learn is from the experience you guys have. So keep getting in contact with us. Keep you know sharing with us on our social media channels. Keep writing blog posts, and we're going to keep updating our you know what we're telling you guys as we hear more and more from you. Um, so other than that, I wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone working to put together Carpentry Con at home. This has been a great session, and there's been tons of great sessions already, and there's still five more weeks to go. And we know it's been a ton of work, so we super appreciate your time. So thank you everybody for coming out and have a great night and a great rest of Carpentry Con at home. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good day. Oh, and please fill out the feedback form on the on the top of the Etherpad. I should have said that first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Fox. Thank you for having me.